of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls over a 30-year period. In 2014, so last year, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police themselves documented 1,181 cases of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls over a similar 30-year period. The actual amount of murdered and disappeared women and girls is likely much higher, as the research so far has been limited to reports that were actually taken by the police, where Indigenous women and girls were correctly identified as such and uh, in, within the Royal Canadian Mounted Police jurisdictions. So this doesn't include city police forces or things like that. In Canada, cases of Indigenous women going missing are too often dismissed by police who claim the so-called high-risk lifestyles of these women as reason not to adequately investigate. The reality is that in Canada today, simply being an Aboriginal woman can be considered living a high-risk lifestyle, as these two things, being Aboriginal and being a woman, is enough to drastically increase our vulnerability to violence, death, poverty, suicide, incarceration, disability, mental health issues, and drug and alcohol addiction. In the 2006 Canadian Census, Aboriginal peoples made up 3.8% of the total Canadian population, with Aboriginal women and girls comprising just over half of the Aboriginal population. As such, 1,181 missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls would be equivalent to approximately 30, 36,000 women in the non-native population. So 1,181 is a huge loss to our relatively small communities. What we need to remember is that our women and girls are not going missing into thin air or being murdered by nameless, faceless entities. Aboriginal women and girls are going missing and being murdered by men. Men that use prostituted women and girls, men that rape, men that beat or murder their wives or girlfriends. All these men have received a lifetime of training to exercise and sexualize the control, domination, and privilege afforded to them in the patriarchal world we live. As Indigenous women and girls, we face the additional layers of oppression by race and class and are constructed as squads. That is, subhuman and disposable, always wanting sex and always being sexually available to men. With form formal colonial systems, such as the Indian residential schools supporting that process. The Indian residential school system forcibly removed Indigenous children from our homes and communities and placed us into church-run, state-funded institutions that not only taught children to speak, dress, and act like our colonizers, but forbade us from expressing our cultures. The last residential school in Canada closed 19 years ago, in 1996. So this is not something that happened hundreds of years ago. This is something that has happened in our lifetime. These institutions taught not only Indigenous women and girls that we had no value, but also taught non-Indigenous people that Indigenous women and girls had no value, and this is key. In Canada, we just wrapped up the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which I have a variety of problems with, um, which was a kind of government uh, project or, or, uh, to address the, uh, the residential school system and the harms. But what non-Indigenous Canadians haven't begun to do yet is look at the effects that the residential schools had on them. So they haven't begun to undo the education that the residential schools gave to them regarding the value of Indigenous women and girls. We were taught that our, in these schools, we were taught that our ways of life, our traditional worldviews, languages, spiritualities, and laws were worthless. And that we as Indigenous women had no value simply because of who we are and that asking for safety, security, and the right to live joy, joyful, fulfilling lives was an impossibility. The residential schools were not about the assimilation of Indigenous peoples into white society, but about the genocide of Indigenous peoples. Children in the schools were set up for quick deaths or slow deaths. Quick deaths in the schools, and we know this, because most residential schools had graveyards in the same location for ease of burying the children who were murdered or killed through abuse or neglect. And mortality rates were very, very high in these schools. In certain periods, um, the mortality rates were up to 
The children that survived were set up for slow and painful deaths as adults through loss of culture and language, addiction, alcoholism, health problems and disability, prostitution, high rates of suicide and violence, poverty, criminalization, and incarceration. The imposition of patriarchy into our communities has had devastating and deadly effects for Aboriginal women and girls. The legal imposition of patriarchy into Indigenous communities was facilitated by the creation of the Indian Act in 1876, a piece of Canadian legislation that continues today. The Sexist Indian Act defined who is and who is not a status Indian and created rights that only status Indians were entitled to. So as a status Indian in Canada, I have a, a little card, that I, an ID card that I carry around with me that tells uh, people that I am an Indian in Canada. Because the Indian Act was created by non-native men, it reflected the patriarchal values held by settlers and interfered with the life-giving transmission of culture from grandmother to mother to daughter by affording indigenous men more ability to pass down status and by taking away the official Indian status of women who married non-native men. As a result, many indigenous women and girls were forced out of our communities. The colonial reserve system was also governed by the Indian Act, and that system forcibly removed us from the expanse of our traditional territories, confining us to small pockets of reserve land, stealing from us, and then buying, selling, and exploiting our homelands as if they were products. Foreign systems of governance in the forms of male-dominated chief and band councils were imposed, and Indigenous women and girls continue to bear the consequences of patriarchy in the form of high rates of rape, incest, and sexual and physical assault, not only from non-Native men, but also from Native men in our own families and communities. Indigenous women experience violence from individual men, Native and non-Native, but also from men as a class from the state. Just in the last week, two investigations in Canada have made the news. One report from British Columbia, where I'm from, has found that the provincial government of British Columbia deliberately deleted communications and documents about the disappearance of mostly Indigenous women and girls along a particular stretch of highway in northern British Columbia, known as the Highway of Tears. On this particular stretch of highway, Highway 16, it's estimated the police have official record of 19 women and girls, mostly Indigenous, who've gone missing along this stretch of highway. Indigenous organizations in the area estimate the number to be closer to 40 and upwards. In the province of Quebec, where I currently live in Canada, Indigenous women have come forward accusing the police of rape and sexual assault, and an investigation into these attacks has been promised. Move the Indians over here, into residential schools, onto the reserves. We hear the same rhetoric used in support of decriminalized or legalized prostitution. Move the women over here, into brothels for their own safety. The system of prostitution was brought to Canada by white settler men, originally in the form of brothels set up around trading posts and military bases, and in the countrywide system. Countrywives were indigenous women exploited in non-legal marriages by white fur traders for their knowledge, skills, and connections, and then simply abandoned when she became inconvenient or a better option, such as a white woman, came along. I have yet to come across an indigenous language that has a word for prostitution in its lexicon. My grandma says there is no word in our language for prostitution, and this is because prostitution is a system that was imposed on indigenous communities and that requires systemic inequalities to exist and flourish. Prostitution is built on capitalism and patriarchy, and racism is a fundamental building block of the system. Racism is not only tolerated in prostitution and pornography, but expressed openly and encouraged. Prostitution did not exist and is not and was not a traditional practice among the indigenous peoples I have encountered. Traditionally, our women and girls were valued and respected and held in very high regard. So we had decision-making roles, leadership roles, we were valued as equal participants in our community. When we describe prostitution as the world, world's oldest profession, which I'm sure we all hear a lot, we are both inaccurate and racist in a complete disregard of complex indigenous histories where the system of prostitution did not exist. So if we think about it in that sense, 
prostitution is only a few hundred years old in Canada. It's only a recent addition to the Canadian landscape. Prostitution teaches non-native and indigenous women and girls that we are disposable in life, and the inaction by our governments and the growing list of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls teaches us that we are disposable even in death. Today, Bradley Barton, a white Canadian man, walks free. He was acquitted by a jury earlier this year for murdering an indigenous woman. He was a known John to this woman and claimed rough sex had accidentally ripped the 11 centimeter tear in this woman's vagina that caused her to bleed to death in the bathtub while he slept in the next room. Pornography depicting the torture of women was found on Barton's laptop but was deemed inadmissible evidence by the court. So he was fully acquitted. He has no criminal record and he walks free in Canada today. The overrepresentation of Indigenous women and girls in street prostitution and the disproportionate murders and disappearances must be analyzed and addressed in tandem. While the Canadian media and many Canadians refuse to acknowledge the connections between these two issues, we must realize that both exist on a continuum of colonial violence against Indigenous women and girls in the context of a contemporary pornified culture. Last year, as a result of the hard work of feminists, indigenous women, um, and women of color, and prostitution survivors, Canada introduced legislation that criminalized the buying of sex. The legislation falls short of the Nordic model, the model we want implemented in Canada, but it's a very important step in the right direction. Just last week, Canada elected a new prime minister, and we are worried about the future of this new legislation. We will need the support of our international sisters as we move forward. Violence against Indigenous women and girls in Canada is not decreasing. The last time I was sexually assaulted was in 2011 and in 2012, when I was speaking about these issues. The work that I do, my level of education, where I choose to live, as an Indigenous woman, these things will not protect me. Being born an Indigenous girl in Canada means I am at least three and a half times more likely to experience male violence than a non-Indigenous woman. The end of porn culture and the restoration of a culture where women have the right to say no and men create a new definition of masculinity that is kind, caring, and loving. And we as Indigenous women and girls are valued and loved and our inalienable rights to our lands, languages, and cultures are respected and prostitution is not seen as inevitable. This is the type of country I want to live in. I'm fortunate. I hear echoes of that world in my grandma's stories. My blood carries memory of a world where the systemic rape, oppression, and murder of women and girls did not exist. We reject, as Indigenous women, the whitewashed individual empowerment rhetoric and the racist disregard for the collective worldviews of Indigenous peoples. An individualized worldview that defines freedom as the ability to do whatever you want disregards structural inequalities and encourages some of us to enjoy the privilege of not being in prostitution at the expense of the hundreds of thousands of women and girls here in Canada and around the world who do not have that luxury. Prostitution policies around the world affect us as Indigenous women. What happens in India, in Germany, in the Netherlands, in New Zealand affect us as Indigenous women. We have a responsibility to each other as women, as mothers, as daughters, as grandmothers to stand up. We have a history as feminists or we have benefited from the history of courageous feminists who have opened doors, blockaded roads, broken down barriers, offered their hands and their homes and laid down their lives for the good of us all. We have a responsibility when we see injustice to speak out against that injustice. To imagine we live in a culture where we are silenced for saying we have a right to say no to sex with strangers or we deserve safety, we deserve fulfilling lives, we deserve freedom. I can only hope we'll look back in a hundred years and say how could we have done this to each other. To quote a woman, and to end, who participated in one of my art projects, decolonization means ending patriarchy. To end violence against indigenous women and girls, we need to smash capitalism patriarchy and colonialism, and restore traditional indigenous values of collectivity, respect for women, and respect for the earth, skies, waters, and our non-human relations. And we need our indigenous and non-indigenous sisters to stand with us and work together, shoulder to shoulder. There is no other way.